Okay, well, hello everyone. It's uh, let's just start uh, the session with Mala Tapar, and then her session is called Be the Change. Mala has, uh, like it was said before earlier this week, uh, a quite impressive uh, biography. Biography, sorry, she's an award winner for her essay competition on the global ethic at the Parliament of the World's Religions in Chicago. She facilitates international workshops on using theater as a healing tool for the marginalized and exceptionalities. A speaker on Leonardo da Vinci's thinking and, communi and communicating skills, multidimensional role of the teacher and creativity author of books on culture, literature, culture, mindfulness, and mindfulness, cultural quantums, cultural awakenings, significance of signs commodification of seniors and signature cultures, motivational speaker, humanist, theater artist, visual art, and a teacher. Uh, that, that's Mala. Like I said, uh, quite impressive. Uh, but I had the pleasure to meet her personally at the, at the, world, uh, the Parliament of the World's Religions uh, Convention in Chicago. And, uh, and yeah, it's a beautiful human being throughout. So Mala, if you can please uh, introduce us to your, sorry, introduce us to your, your session and, and let us know what Beat the Change is all about. Thank you, Nexi, very much. It was a pleasure meeting you and to be invited to join Humphreys for the United Nations 75th anniversary on humanity and humanism. So here I am. I'll begin with a personal example, what really set me going. Um, Gandhiji is very dear to me because he comes from India and I'd heard a lot of things about him. But even before that, I remember from personal example, one day I noticed a tap running, a municipal tap, while going to school in a rickshaw and coming back. And this happened frequently. I would ask the rickshaw driver to pause and I turn the tap off. And then coming back, I saw the same thing, same tap running. So people use the water, but they never... Uh, bothered to turn off the tap and this bothered me so eventually I found a solution in writing to the local person municipal board and saying please make sure that the tap is turned off or a different kind of fossil is put there faucets put there and that happened so that was one change I wanted to see and I was so pleased and I was in grade eight to see this change Another change which comes to my mind is that since we used to go in rickshaws and take 45 minutes because we lived outside Kanpur, so a lot of students used to be huddled together, falling asleep. It was very dangerous. The rickshaw used to go over bridges and down traffic between trucks. So, and it was a very well-to-do school, St. Mary's Convent, and German nuns ran it. So I once went to the principal and said, this is very dangerous. And I find the rickshaw just thumps and students keep falling off and on. So we'd like a bus if you don't mind. So the principal, Sister Celine, said, well, if you want one, you have to get every parent in that area to sign off. We must have X number of students in order to run a bus. So at that point in time, there were no cell phones, nothing. So I went in a rickshaw door to door to all the students who I knew were on the uh, in the area and had their parents sign that letter, which I had written, handwritten letter for the requirement of the bus. Once we had about 30 students who were coming from that area, I took it to Sister Celine, and sure enough, a bus was ordered, a Volkswagen was ordered, bus from Germany came in and it was beautiful. Everybody heaved a sigh of relief. So that was another change, which I feel I brought this up. This happened in grade nine when uh, students were really suffering and parents were suffering. So this change was brought about by taking initiative and taking action, not just wanting something. Another incident happened in school when uh, we used to adopt a village on the banks of River Ganges, which lay just behind the school. And each student looked after one family in the slums. When we went there, we saw their needs, how poverty driven they were. So I spoke to one of the sisters there at the convent and uh, Sister Wilfred, I remember clearly, I said, why don't we start a free kitchen? They're short of food. So let's say everybody brings one class, brings a potato each because it was a large school, 2000 students. One class brings tomatoes and so on and so forth. So we can have enough to make soup 
and some vegetables and feed these people bread. So the idea stuck to her. I'm so grateful that I was in a school where people are receptive. And sure enough, from grade nine, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, weekends were free kitchen. And the people would come in in lines and they would be fed. It gave me immense happiness and satisfaction. So from here on, I became very, very interested in being the change that we wish to see in others. These are the words of Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma means a spiritual soul, a great soul. And Gandhi came to this consciousness when he was thrown out of a railway uh, station on a railway station in East Africa, despite having a first class ticket for the simple reason that they did not want colored people to have a first class ticket and sit in a first class compartment. That really raised his consciousness. He, he moved to India and he realized upon seeing this incident, which I'm going to quote, in the tea gardens of India, the tea pickers were very poor people and they would come in the morning, take off their boots and sandals and go around picking up leaves. And the whole day was spent in the evening when they came, they couldn't find their shoes. And it took them a considerable time to find them and then go home and attend to their children. And after a couple of days when Gandhi washed this, he hid behind a bush to see what happened and who really hid their shoes. Then he noticed that these were the children of the British officers in colonial India who were doing this. Next day, he confronted them and he said, why are you doing this? So they said, oh, it's so much fun, so much fun to see them all looking around, running around like hide and seek, finding the shoes. So Gandhi said to them, well, there's a better way of having fun. Do you want to know? They were all ears. And Gandhi told them. Now you go home and get a rupee coin. And when you bring it, you place it in each of their shoes. And then you watch the fun. They did as asked. So next day, when the tea pickers came, they not only found the slippers, but they also found a rupee coin in them. They were delighted and beaming with smiles. And the children understood it, made them happy too. Then Gandhi told them, there are many ways of having fun. And one of them is to make sure that other person is happy. So he brought about a change of paradigm shift in this manner in shifting the thinking. And that is what our education needs today in order to provide children with alternative methods of having fun and not just through video games and war games, which are accentuating the violence in society and in homes. Another incident that about Gandhi, which I want to quote, is that he um, attended the roundtable conference in England in a loin cloth, which he had spun, while others were all in three-piece suits. Not that he couldn't afford that, but he was proving a point of being independent. India, at that point, was exporting uh, raw materials to Britain, and the clothing was made there and sold back in India. And therefore India was getting poorer. So he made a heap, a bonfire of these clothes and he said, spin your own cloth. That is why we have the uh, spinning wheel on our Indian flag. It's a motto, it's a motive of what Gandhi thought being independent. Then the British said that it took the entire British empire to keep Gandhi in poverty because Gandhi believed that a man is rich by the number of things he can do without. And that took a long way. He brought the entire country together and it won its independence without war. That is the meaning, that's the main thing. Very peacefully, this whole procedure took place through Satyagraha. Satyagraha is uh, truth, uh, seeking truth through nonviolent means. He promoted the role of women in society for social change. And his two nieces were always with him at the prayer meetings. His spiritual power was so great that it really took over the entire nation, proving the point that it's not just the physical power, but the spiritual power that moves mountains. And this we saw. He had a forgiving heart. The man who shot him, Nathuram Godse, after a prayer meeting, fell to his knees and asked his forgiveness. 
and Gandhi forgave him, saying that it is always divine to forgive because people are ignorant who do this. And same thing was quoted by Jesus Christ too, to forgive. So therefore we see a thread, a thread of kindness, forgiveness, and change in action being the change that we want to see. If people don't forgive each other, if things go haywire, then there's always a war. There are truce as we are having now in Hamas and Israel. And all along we're having it. Was, um, in various countries, blocks, First World War, Second World War, we saw so much tragedy, arms race, pollution of the atmosphere, diseases coming into being, animal testing, overtaking animal care. So all these things came to bring about a change in the environment, global environment, which became polluted because each missile that is fired gives out nefarious gases. Then it also consumption of uh, uh, fuels resources which are being depleted in the earth. So all these things have added to it. On one hand, we want the environment to be safe. We want to prevent global warming. But on the other hand, we are depleting our country of resources, our world of its fauna and flora and all the other resources. The waters are getting polluted. The oceans are getting polluted with plastic. Our use of plastic is so immense. So we can change these things by changing our habits. For example, we don't need to use a plastic bag. In India, again, because I keep going there, I notice that they started using cloth bags or paper bags, no plastic bags. And here I find that even every cucumber is wrapped in plastic bag. So imagine so many thousands of cucumbers in so many stores with each one wrapped, how much more plastic is created. And then the oceans, the life in the ocean eats that. And that is the fish we eat. And it takes a long time to consume the diapers and the, and the plastic to disintegrate. It takes years and years and tens of years, maybe hundreds of years. Therefore, it is so important to be very conscious. And this consciousness is what Gandhiji spoke about. The consciousness of the human being, it arises from humanity, em empathy, feeling for the other. The other is not just human, but also the animal, the environment, the flora and fauna. In this world of technology, I bring another person, that is Ursula Franklin, a metallurgist and a UFT professor, a person who was wrote the book, The Real World of Technology, and her talks at the Massey Hall in Toronto, her lectures uh, have been very, very famous because she brought about what we are having today. She foresaw what's going to happen. And she said that in this world of technology that we are building, it's expanding all the time. But technology is soulless. It really doesn't have a soul. So it doesn't, it's a good tool, but a bad master. So what we are doing today is we are making it a master. And this is how. For example, instead of going to the church or, or the temple, everybody goes to their cell phones to the internet to see what to do. So that is the religious, the new religion of the world is technology. But how we use that technology, for what purposes, what dimensions is what is going to decide our fate as a human beings. For example, in this house of technology, we are seeing a great fatal mistake being made through using it in every form so that the brain's usage is growing less and technology is growing more, whether it's calculations, mathematical, whether it's thinking, whether it's intelligence, anything and everything we hop into it, communications, those machines are there, answering machines, you barely get a live person at the other end. So it's really very restrictive. And this is what Ursula Franklin spoke about, two types of technology, the two corridors that we, she saw well in time, prescriptive technology and holistic technology. Prescriptive technology is that technology which takes away the power from the creator, from the innovator, and then dampens it. For example, you've given your powers away to technology and you're no longer able to say empowered or make changes. Holistic technology is when the creator keeps the power with him, within himself. For example, technology can't differentiate 
own it. But in mass media, when everything everybody knows, like John Orwell's, George Orwell's 84, uh, there are no secrets. With artificial intelligence, this dipping into all kinds of data from anywhere and everywhere. So everything's available to everybody. So what your production is not really your production, it's worked upon and it becomes somebody else's idea. Then that is worked upon, becomes on somebody else's idea. So therefore, in this cesspool of creativity, we are losing our individuality. That is how I feel. And that is how Ursula Franklin saw it. So she, she, she warned us that if we are to be humane, we have to be soulful and connected. Now, how do we connect to each other? How do we bring the change? The change is happening so rapidly. In my lifetime itself, I've seen the change from my parents' time to my time and now to my children's time. And it's running at a speed that's hard to catch. So everybody is learning new techniques and technology so they can keep up with it. Now, all that's very good, very fine, as long as we don't throw the baby with the bathwater. By this, I mean that we don't give up our good old values in the search of technology, values being connectivity with our parents, with our family, with our friends, learning the values of upholding character over everything else. So it's not going to be speed over everything. Now here it's coming to speed over everything. Who can do the fastest run? Another thing, Marshall McLuhan calls the speed race as, and the motor car, the automobile as the mechanical bride. The reason he does this is because once the mechanical bride is on the move, automobile is on the move, then every distance is lessened, which is great. People can reach people. But at the same time, the connectivity of the people, the time that they spent with each other is reduced. So you lose control of who's run off where. You can't really reach them unless they want to reach you. So it becomes very prescriptive. Then there are other things that come to mind which need to be changed. And we all have those eating habits. For example, diseases are on the rise and so many um, viruses are in the air. How can we check those if we do not have certain communication about the people who stay healthy and compare it with those who are getting more sick, about family dinners, all that's gone. So it's bun on the run and that bun on the run, what it has, nobody cares. It's just about filling your stomach. Education's turned to literacy, which is just passing an examination. And the values of education are gone. Education of the heart, empathic education is what we really need. Coming to this, Ursula Franklin also said that Social change is not going to come through by an avalanche down the mountains, but from seeds growing in well-prepared soil. And it is this soil that we as educators need to prepare. And we as leaders, whether it be political, economic, corporate, or wherever we are, we need to prepare the soil. The students' minds have to be prepared to critical thinking, creative thinking, grasping the meaning behind the words, not giving pat answers and multiple questions and getting a high mark and feeling well. We are very good. We know everything. And I tell my students that all the time. I said, look, it's not just about you getting a mark. It's about the understanding of the matter and application of the matter that matters. That brings the change in community and amongst yourselves. So that is very important. She talks about change coming from seeds of consciousness planted in well-prepared soil of education, which is democratic. When I say democratic, I mean that we are, there is one person now preparing the curriculum who's in the board office. And by the time it passes down, the staff members have to adopt to it. They have their break up in the chain there, then the students, the receptacles. So instead of students being just the receptacles, they should be active, participants, for example, in the three-legged stool of education, that is the student, the parent, and the, and the teacher. So the student, parent, and the teacher must all three be involved in forming the curriculum, in executing the curriculum, and in assessments. Now, the reason I say this is based upon a school which was started by A.S. Neil called Summerhill in Scotland in 1946. And this school had happiness as its core value. And the name 
the reason why uh, there were no disciplinary issues here is because everybody pursued what their interest was in learning and there was that love of motivation motivational love to do a thing and it carried them further to really excel in it it was not a forced add-on but with this being said in every sphere of life where leaders create a relationship with the people they lead change happens automatically people want to change they want to be better they want to do better but if the leadership is positional they are in a position and they make everyone know that well i am the leader here and my saying goes then in that positional uh, place they create they breed more disharmony so positional and relationship and relational leaderships these are the two major forms of relationships in which the leader has to be aware firstly in himself aware about what kind of leadership he or she is projecting and secondly about the people what their needs are similarly you now we come down to other facets which is communication skills equity in workplace the communication skills are skills which do not necessarily say giving orders or taking orders or doing the exteriors but they go beneath the surface beneath the surface i mean that they understand what the other person is capable of doing and when the person is capable of doing something you entrust the task to that person not just because that person is holding a particular seat so democratic thinking pooling in of ideas and then entrusting tasks and also guiding them in the task and seeking their opinion how they can add in their ideas so everything becomes a joint effort that is communication giving and receiving feedback very often feedback when it's given it's very limited it's limited to yes this is right no that is wrong but no feedback is to be given about in the ways of giving feedbacks for example when a leader receives a feedback should be based on okay this is how we thought because the reason example and this happens if we do this and this happens to my mind if we don't do this and how can we do this differently to make it more effective to make it more better so all these ways are gentle ways of traveling various perspectives and perceptions because truth is not just one person's perception as gandhi ji said and perspectives are many so unless we pool in the perceptions and perspectives of all those people who are working with us it's very hard to know where the truth lies and very hard for change to come so for the change to come for the better for the war machinery to stop for peace to replace truth and for harmony to be we need to think collectively communicate collectively have more converse, conversations more discussions fewer orders given more uh, ideas taken a more idea banks so to say and equity now equity is very often misunderstood as equal how can everybody be equal we're not talking of that change being the change means providing equal opportunity for others to have a voice again it comes down to ursula franklin's um, organization voices of women when she started that she wanted every woman to have a voice in making the policies in canada in executing them and voices of women has is a good organization today which branches out into many many fields and it's all over so from these people like gandhi ji and ursula franklin and many many more uh, we tried and learned about their various ways of bringing change into the world then we come to mindful behaviors so everybody comes to the world with a mindset and as they grow the mindset gets deeper and deeper and they start viewing the world with the mindset that's called perception with that perception there are sometimes conflicts in perception between people relationally at work and at home but this mindset is not always right but it does spell behaviors and this mindset is based on perceptions if we can for once open our minds we can open our minds 
and grow and let other fresh air from different parts of the world come in, what we do is, what we do is when we get, get it in that we have a consortium, a bonanza of different ideas we can delve into and get a better understanding of how the world is moving. So exceptionalities are often the people who are in the exceptionalities. The people who are uh, uh, marginalized are often left behind. So inclusiveness is vital for democracy and education. And this inclusiveness brings about togetherness and harmony and peace. And there is spiritual resurgence, not just a physical resurgence, not just an emotional resurgence or material resurgence, but a spiritual resurgence which raises consciousness it brings the values to the fore. Technical standardization of cars and back seats give ways to roadways, for example. Similarly, our mindsets and mindfulness brings about a certain core belief that through reflection, we can think better, assess better, and make better policies. We become healthy, wealthy, and blind uh, and wise when there is no moral blindness. But the world today is suffering from moral blindness, says David Hawkins. And we need to shed that in order to get back into an atmosphere where we can all talk to each other, not through wars, not through uh, protests, but talk to each other as human beings, one from each one with the other. Share the opinions, take the opinions, and see what we can do to build a better world. Each negative brings the watcher close to damaging the brain's delicate neutro, neu, uh, neurotransmitters. Each time that we watch a negative television program, video game, or any message, the neurotransmitters are affected. Therefore, we need to limit, to be the change, we need to limit our exposure to the screen, the screen time. But on the contrary, you find every education is becoming completely screen oriented. So you've got to go to your tablet, you've got to go to some other form in order to read your work, write your work and submit it. Very little is conversational. So to my mind, we have to be the change and, in, and include more conversations and more written work so that the handwriting, the idea of writing may not disappear from the world or conversations may not disappear. So with this, I shall say, is there any questions that you'd like to uh, ask me that we need to have the right perception in order to be the change and the right courage, which makes a difference to take that first step and put our ideas into execution. I know it's going to be hard. It's been hard. Nothing worth it is ever easy, but it's all attainable if we, each of us commits themselves to bringing this change to the world. With that, I say thank you. Thank you so much, Mela. Um, I have a question, and and if anyone in the audience got any question, please put them in the chat. Uh, Danielle says, "Wonderfully inspiring." Thank you for these, Mela. My question is, uh, when you talk about chips thinking, I said that we need to kind of like include different activities in the classrooms um, that would kind of like what kind of activities do you recommend and how early can we start? I'll give you an example. In uh, grade 10, I was teaching at St. Columbus, all schools, boys, all boys school. And uh, the children were not very, the students are not very accepting of people with exceptionalities. So when they just occurred to me in a class, I said, you all take a handkerchief now and tie it around your nice, blindfold yourselves and just walk around the class. You know? So they were thought it was good fun. I said, fine. They went knocking against desks and things, dropping things. And they did that at the end of the day. I'm not end of the period of 10 minutes. I said, okay, take off your um, the, whatever you're blindfolding yourself with, handkerchiefs or whatever. They took it off and I asked them, how did you feel? There's some people say, so we felt that some people were laughing at us and making a joke of us and, and uh, we were not very comfortable. 
I said, this is exactly what happens when there are people with exceptionalities who are partially blind or cognitively impaired, you know, who are in the classroom and either they are totally ignored and ostracized and others keep grouping themselves as friends or they make mistakes and people laugh at them. So that was just one small thing. It was way back in 10, 15, 15 years ago, I think. This will happen. Now, creativity. Regarding creativity, I ran a scamper program in uh, American Embassy School. And this was on how to create uh, creative teaching, for example, it was. Now, not everybody is a visual learner. Not everybody is an auditory learner. Different kinds of learners. They're in the class, in the same class. Now, for the teacher to really, to really give everybody a fair chance is very hard. So therefore, how many types of learners we have to assess? The teachers will depend on our assessment. Then this is the thing that said substitute. For example, if a person cannot do this, they can do something else. That's where discernment policy came in. I wrote it down. I said in order to discern, see who can do what better, firstly. So we have logs. And if a person is an audio learner, then use audio methods to teach that person another visual learner so as you the blackboard keep drawing showing for example different kinds of through arrows this points this way geography history whatever everything can be taught some people were kinesthetic learners that's where theater came into being and theater got integrated into all the subjects for example at Mahatma Gandhi International School in Ahmedabad, you know, there's a French person who runs it, his wife is Indian. So I was invited to give a talk on you integrating theater and the curriculum. So the math teachers are wondering, is how do we teach math with theater? But many people want to move around. Youngsters love to get up and move. They can't be seated in one place for one hour and 40 minutes. It's just too much. So I said, okay, you want to teach them circles. Let's see, you want to teach them circles. Form a body, a circle with the body, right? Form, this is the radius, this is the circumference, and the pi r squared at the end. You want to teach triangles, different kinds of triangles. We can start with that. Similarly, geometry, algebra. So I went through each of these methods in which theater could be used and kinesthetic energy could be used. People who wanted to run and jump and they were not happy in just listening to a lecture at that age. It's not possible. So these, these are the creative measures in which we can really uh, teach subjects like grammar, for example, dry subject grammar. And grammar is, was a must a compulsory subject at that point when I was teaching. So parts of speech, eight parts of speech, Students don't learn today, but we have to teach them. They said, oh, what, eight passes, everybody forgot. I said, okay, let's make a train. So everybody make a train. Eight, and there were eight compartments in it, noun, verbs, so on, so on, so on. And we added them. And each person became a compartment. You know, so I said, I'm a noun, what do I do? This is what I do. I'm a verb, what do I do? An adjective, what do I do? So then we furthered on into more and more compartments a collective noun, different five types of nouns, different types of adjectives. And that way, it, the whole sub, the subject was kinesthetically taught. And it became interesting for them because they produced their play. They wrote their play. Each one wrote their part. And through role play and presentation, it became creativity. Mm -hmm. Then there were conflicts in the staff. And there are lots of little things in every organization which come to you and through the grapevine and it is here that creativity comes into being. For example, uh, scampers, uh, substitute, combine. Sometimes you can combine activities to solve a problem Then you can alternate a uh, alternate activities to give space and time, then maximize and minimize them depending on what the situation is and prioritize some things. So all these are the real life skills, which I feel we are not teaching our children today. In different having taught in different countries and different schools and uh, because my husband was in the air force we kept traveling so that kind of gave me an inkling into how humanity at n large functions so prior work together with each other understand each other better and one thing I noticed when I came from the East to the West, 23 years plus now, I noticed that uh, uh, here, every fifth person had ADD, HD in class. There were lots of things that were coming up. And also there was more, more people who were mentally sick.
and um just to give you the heads up Nala, your internet connection is cutting out to my research Um, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I can hear you, but you, you, your internet connection was, wasn't stable, so you were cutting in and out. Or should I repeat? Where was that? Yeah, that I repeat from from the the section that you said when you were coming from the east to the west. Okay. That's up until I, yeah. yeah correct. So when I was coming from the east to the west, the major differences between Eastern culture and Western culture, for example, Japan, China, India and the West, North America and Europe is this. Now the high context cultures and low context cultures, for example, the Eastern cultures are high context and the Western cultures are low context. High low means that they're more based in their families and their traditions, high context. And low context means they frankly speak what they mean and they say what they mean and they know upfront they are more, right? For example, in Japan, you read the air in the sense when you're talking in business and they say, oh, where did you read the air? People don't say what, immediately what to think they kind of read the air where's the other person thinking how is he feeling should we say this so that's called reading the air whereas uh, the americans will say what they have to say and the other person at times finds it very rude or kind of you know it's different so it's a cultural thing but we don't have culture studies in schools we just don't have it and we need to have culture studies in order to encourage culture connection, people to connect each other with each other and not have cultural wars in schools, outside schools. We can prevent all that if we start building on cultural education. It's not just the foods we eat or the clothes we wear, but also the history of the country, the civilization. For example, these ancient civilizations, which really are very rich and deep in family values, are now today nobody knows about them they just know about the wars history relates to wars but history is not just the wars it's not getting independence it's also dependence upon the values family values the civilizations that brought them together for example the mohenjo-daro the best sanitation in the world first started many hundreds of years ago was it mohenjo-daro so middle eastern train eastern train was all very connected and because there was connections over there, civilizational connect, uh, connections, so they came to be a togetherness, which was split up by wars, and which is still going on more and more split up. So you've had two world wars, you've seen the destruction caused, and we are still not ready to have peace. That is what bothers me. And peace starts in the heart of a person, in the home of a person, and then travels to the school. And from the school, it travels to the university, to the environment, to workplace, leadership, and so on and so forth. If it's I, me, and myself, as Montague says, he who lives for himself alone lives for the meanest mortal known. So we have to reach out of ourselves and delve into the other. You know, in, in a way, we have to forget ourselves when we are listening to others. Listening is a skill which is long gone. If people listen to each other, more than half of the world's problems would not be there. You know, therefore, if we just begin to listen to each other and hear, even hear the air, what is it all about? Then we get a sense of how we can change to fit the other and how others can, we can make the world a little better place. And it's high time we did it. Otherwise, the environment will be affected. Social environment, natural environment, material environment and sustainability will be at risk. Then social justice. Without social justice, there can be no harmony and peace. So social justice also, the change has to be brought in. For example, raise your voices if you see something that hits you and how can you change it? But just to go under, it's not my concern. If something's happening to somebody who's being bullied, it's not my concern, no. It is, as a collective humanity, it is our concern to raise our voices, to take it up and see where we can make a difference. To my mind, I feel that's very vital. Thank you, Mala. I'm so happy. Beautiful. <laughs> what, Thank you. what a lovely um, team. 
Yes, go ahead. Sorry, any questions from from the from the audience? I have a comment from Daniel Gardiner Millen. Wonderfully inspiring. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this for your lovely compliment. There's a compliment from Rabia Asani. Thank you very much. And Nexi, thank you very much. <laughs> so oh, thank you. It. Yeah, it's always beautiful to listen to you. I mean, I, I, you know, it's like, how do we teach creatively, right? Our students, how we, how we foster social justice, how we, how we start cultivating peace, harmony, and, and love since they're very, very young. So we don't have these issues like, you know, like repeating, repeating themselves. So we don't have to do these kind of conventions in 50 years or 25 years. So thank the you so thing, much. One thing also I must tell you, I find most parents feed the young children all the time. When even a child has grown a little more, they'll put the food in the mouth of the child. But there are two things that happen then. When you're feeding a child, you must also tell the child, Make sure that the child looks at you and make ask him if you can please pass you this dish. You can pass your spoon. You want to feed yourself. Pass a banana. So make them feed you too. So it becomes you're teaching give and take at that level. Usually they have maids or you know people look, caregivers for the little children and they're feeding, putting their food in their mouth. Okay, take this, take this. When a child is hungry, he or she is bound to eat. They'll grab anything and put it in their mouth. And when they learn to share, this is the place where they learn to share. I found when I came to the West, people would open their tiffins and start eating, but nobody asked the other person. And that was a big difference in their um, other cultures. You know, for example, they'd open the tiffin and say, would you like to have some first? Then they'd eat themselves. So if we train when the kids are at home, you know, first offer your parents the other way around. Would you like some? You know, even if you don't, you take a little and then you take yourself. So that kind of role modeling is very vital. Role modeling of peace, role modeling of give and take, of uh, being responsible to your parents, being well-mannered to your parents, because parents otherwise get left out. As we've seen in the West, children grow up, they not it's okay if they're on first name basis, but they get left behind and they get put in senior homes and other places. So we need to build a rapport where a child feels responsible for the parent and for society and seniors, no matter what position he's occupying or she's occupying. And that starts when they're young, three years old, four years old. You know, that's the time when you learn to share, <laughs> like combing my hair. For example, I used to comb my father's hair. He used to just give me a comb, he said, brush my hair and my mother's hair. I was just to take so much pleasure that they'd ask me to do their hair. So it gave me a sense of joy and that helped. And they made my hair then, you know, it was like sharing little, little things for each other. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I like that. Uh, make it for you to uh, teach them the give and take. Uh, whenever my kid offers me something, even if I don't want it, I take it and I eat it. Uh, yeah, so I thank you. That truly really resonates with me quite a lot. It builds, it builds acceptance also because the child feels confident. Confident that my mother will take it, right? She's a friend. She sees you as a trustworthy person. It builds so much trust you won't believe it. It's just wonderful. So these are the thank little you. things. Yeah. I hope I haven't stretched more than my time. Which is, I do not oh, no. Oh, no, you haven't. <laughs> Rabia says, I've learned useful and beneficial information. Yes, even languages, even languages you can teach. Like I learned four languages when I was four years old, three, four, five, six spoken in the house. And then you just adopt them. You really don't need to learn because if people are speaking, you hear them, you find the meanings, poetry readings go on in the house. Every Sunday we had poetry readings, you know, just for the fun of it. So each one found a poet and they read it. So we realize that these are the little things that build depth of character, love of literature, and also join us together, you know? I was taking notes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you. 
it's been a total pleasure. I tell you honestly, I feel so happy, honored, and grateful that we had this opportunity to share. And this is, I hope this whole thing envelope expands and then we can more have such people, timings and people can share the experiences, their learning and bring to the fore things and others can benefit from them. And that's how our society will be uplifted and changed. That's how I feel. The children are so, even now when I give talks to students, not just schools, colleges, wherever, they, they just light up. You know, suddenly like a bulb lights, in the, this we can do. What can you do for your parents? Parents are always expected to do for the children. What can you do for your parents? Make your mother happy today. You know, so, oh, we never thought of this. Think of this, you know? So then they start thinking, even one thing a day you do, which makes your mother happy, your father happy, your teacher happy, do it. You know, and then come back and tell me how it felt. And be surprised, this is a total paradigm is shifting. But teachers don't ask anymore. They never ask. It's just do this work. This is, have you done your work? Work is not just the written work, it's the heart work. So therefore, my next book is going to be Education of the Heart. And I'm writing that. I feel time has come that we connected the hearts together. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thanks, Nixie. <laughs> it's lovely. Thank you. It, it was great. Um, I went away from my script a little because the script was very limited. I didn't just want to read. I wanted to bring a broader plethora of experience to my work. Mm -hmm. So I started teaching at 19 and then went to be a journalist and wrote and traveled. So all those things that I learned, I wanted to take a few examples from each and just bring it to the table. East mm -hmm. West perspective. So people and the students are so thrilled. They just jump up. Literally, you know, when they strike an idea, because and no problems in class. Why? Because they're thinking. First, my first priority is to get them thinking. You think. What do you think? My favorite line is, what do you think? This is the written word, but what do you think? <laughs> okay. When I say something, what do you think? Because you're always asking us, what do you think? I say, because your opinion counts. Make them count. Make every child and every student count by making his mind count, taking his opinion or her opinion, you know? I learned that from my father. I didn't like to eat eggs. He didn't, I uh, knew it was good for my health. So he said, how would you like your egg? Should I fry it, make a omelet, boil it? <laughs> so there are various ways of promoting what you wish to promote by giving a choice. So give choices. Change is brought about by giving choices, right? Mm 